Hello, everybody. My name is Dennis Shaw. Welcome to the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup. We're now meeting every Thursday, with the exception of a few weeks, online here on Zoom. Today, we're talking about a great topic, building successful online communities. And after all, where we are in the world right now, aren't we all just one big online community? Excited to have Linda Crow. Linda is Program Director of IBM Community and Celia Chase, VP of Marketing at Orion X. Linda and Celia, thanks for joining us and take it away. Great. Thank you. I appreciate those introductions. And I'm going to do some screen sharing here. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yes. Yes. So we covered that. We're excited to be at this meetup today. As I mentioned that Shaheen Khan is a colleague of mine as well as Cindy Mock, and we're all part of the Orion X team and we're a marketing services agency and also do injury in industry analysis. Excuse me. And Linda, if you want to just say hello and everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves. Yep. I'm Linda Crow. I'm the program director for uh, the IBM community. I've been there, uh, been at IBM for just a little over three years now, um, building the community and uh, happy to be here with you guys. Great. So we're going to talk about how to build an online community, creating a successful online community. I'm going to do a little bit more of the nuts and bolts and give the background in terms of why it's important, how to build and grow and engage. And then Linda's going to talk about all the stuff they're actually doing at IBM and what the, what, you know, more of the case study and showcase the actual communities and the results that they've had. And we want to leave time to have a discussion and answer any questions. So the big thing about online community is there's really benefits for both sides of the house, for the brands as well as the members. And so, you know, if we think of more of on the, the company side is usually where, where most people come from. You know, there's a lot of different reasons that it's important now. It's they've been growing over the last 10, 20 years. It's, it gives us a way to interact with uh, customers or potential customers. Um, we can get really uh, candid feedback on products or services and understand what people, how they're using our products or services. We can also uh, use communities as to, to develop brand ambassadors. Um, and a big part of commun this community is even with this meetup is, you know, they, they tended to be, have a face-to-face -face component, but that's at least for now, mostly gone away. And so we're really relying more on the online piece, which is which is uh, pretty intuitive. We're all facing that now. Um, so how to make it engaging. So, you know, there's a lot of digital saturation going on. So it's important that we keep people engaged and keep things lively. Um, and in addition to some of these benefits in terms of insights, there's, there's, there's also been some interesting studies that AdAge came out recently. And of the companies they surveyed, over 50% of the businesses said that they were able to reduce their customer acquisition costs by up to 25%. So there's some real concrete business benefits as well. And you, you often see that the successful online communities have uh, bigger opportunities for upsells and cross sells and repeat purchases with people that are actively engaged in communities. So with some real concrete benefits. And then on the, the member side, you know, people want to engage with communities because they got like minded folks that they can share resources, they might be able to get question answers that they can't find elsewhere, or they can go to an industry expert and just learn or, or have um, some place to connect to. So how to build a community. We, we've looked at kind of five components of, of how to build a community and starting off with um, objectives and with any, make sure I'm showing my right screen here. Sorry, my screen was doing something funny. Um, and this is really tying back into, you know, what's going on at your business and what you want to achieve with your community. So. It can be a place, like I was talking about earlier, where you know, you're just uh, bringing your customers to get together. Is it, is it a place to connect, um, have interesting insights, exchange information? Um, but more commonly now, and I know Linda's gonna talk about this when she showcases IBM, is it can be, a build, be about building a demand gen funnel or a lead gen funnel. Um, and it, it, it can also be like, um, you, one of your objectives might be to improve customer satisfaction or create brand advocates. But the, the important thing here is to note, um, to be clear about what your objectives are, because that's really going to shape how you go about your community, what content you create, how you're gonna moderate it and so forth.
than audience. And that seems pretty intuitive, but one thing to think about an audience in terms of community is I, is I really liked this, this quote by, by Chris Brogan in terms of, um, you know, considering an audience in a community is, is which way the chairs are facing. So when you think of your, if you're speaking an event, you know, the chairs are gonna be facing you, but really in a community, they're facing each other because it's an opportunity to come together. In a community, you're, you're really, you're earning your audience. You're not paying for them, you know, in a situation where you might be advertising. So they're gonna to wanna to be coming together under, under a common topic, a common thread. You know, if you look at something just as an example here at LinkedIn, there's an ERP community, which is a pretty broad swath. And then there's a lot of sub communities within that, you know, things related to ERP sales or ERP implementers. So um, there's, you know, there's sub categories or segments based on people's interests. One thing when you're setting up a community in terms of your audience is understanding what's already out there, you know, not being redundant or what other conversations are going on or what's resonating with the community and what's your, what's your audience going to be interested in. The next thing we looked at was the platform and the platform is going to tie back into your objectives. So is this something that, you know, is this just a local community? Is it something that you're going to go global with and what is your platform going to need to support? Do you want to have more control or more flexibility? There's a lot of things you can do plug and play type models where, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn that you can, or Slack that you can, you can plug into models that are really up and, already established and pretty easy to, for you to get up and running quickly, but you're going to lose flexibility and customizability if you use those type of like those type of platforms. Yet, and when you consider your platform, you might also want to think about uh, what your audience is already using. Are they already on a face or a lot of them already on Facebook? Are they already on LinkedIn? Is that going to be easy and the best way to reach them? Um, Linda, I think you're going to talk about this too in terms of the particular software that you guys used and how you went about setting that up. And so they really needed a customized function functionality. Another thing to think about with the with your platform is the CRM integration. You know, and thinking about again going back to your objectives. If this is going to be a lead gen um, tool for you, then tying it in, making sure it's going to tie into your CRM. So guidelines you know, in any community, you're going to want to have consistent guidelines of how people are going to engage with the community. You know, what are, what are the rules for the engagement? And one, one really important factor here is to have a moderator. And that moderator will help facilitate the discussion, keep it on track, keep things positive. And sometimes in communities, you know, you see things and get snarky or negative. So how are you going to address that and, and having the moderator um, keep, keep bringing them back into um, you know, what, what are going to be the guidelines of how you engage into this community. And also keeping the, the interaction lively and engaging and mixing it up. You know, maybe it'll be humorous sometimes, maybe it'll be informative. Metrics. Metrics with her. It's so important now. We all hear that a lot in, in uh, being marketing folks. And how are you going to measure your commu community? So your management is obviously going to really care about what are the measures? It might be things as straightforward as the number of followers, shares, likes, the growth in terms of who was a part of the community, but it could be things of um, uh, reduction in customer support cases. Um, there was a SAP Hybris actually looked at uh, one of the way they measured their community was how long it took to get an answer. Or um, Qual had a measurement where they looked at how many ideas were created on their communities. There's a, a lot of different ways that you can track what you see isn't important, but to be able to look at that over time and so to understand if you're being successful or effective. So I've talked about how to set it up and we're gonna look a little bit about how to grow your community. And the biggest part, biggest value of a community is is your members you know those those are the folks that are contributing that are engaging um so some of this is pretty straightforward in terms of you know commuting it just on a, a promote, promoting it through a cross-channel basis through your social media through your websites um, informing your partners including in your partner collateral on your emails email templates 
uh, you can see here in this particular case, we've just given a shout out to the SAP community where they're highlighting it on their website and you know, having some great little bit of a bragging rights here, you know, the number of blog posts and questions answered. And so getting people really like, oh, there's a lot going on here. I wanna, I wanna participate in this. I wanna be part of this discussion. Another, another way is an ambassador program, having an expert, um, having a designated person that um, recognized as an influencer um, to help support topics. You might have different experts for different threads. And so they can really carry the weight of the, having the knowledge base and um, establishing a source of ideas and opinions. Doing some gamification is a big popular thing now. A lot of discussion on, um, you know, is this a fad now or something that has some longevity to it, but certainly having ways to recognize people in your community through um, badging um, so that people, you know, have a sense of being recognized. So I can put this on my online profile or my CV or, you know, I'm a prominent member, they're being recognized. Um, they might, you might have a certain type of jargon that you use within your community that only people that are within the community will really know what you're talking about. It gives that sense of being included in something. Uh, top contributors might get points or you could get points for just contributing and then you, you move up the ranks as you're, as you're participating regularly. Uh, there's an example where Reddit gives awards and they show appreciation for you know, having except, exceptional contributions or content. So these are just different ways of how to grow, how to grow your community. And then the last area that really that I'm going to cover before I pass off the baton to Linda is, is engaging with your community. And that's really uh, the critical factor is the moderator. I've talked about that before. And they're gonna really be looking at you know, what's resonating, what's working, what's not, and making adjustments accordingly. Having consistent uh, content and interaction that aligns with your brand is really important so people know what to expect and what's going on in the community. Um, and and that's a, that goes, ties back into how you're segmenting the topics and tailoring the content according to what the community is going to be engaged in. It, your community might be getting too large and so there might be too many different threads going on and at that point you consider having uh, sub-communities or breaking them apart. Um, another way is to have an editorial calendar and that gives you an opportunity to step back and ensure you're mixing up your content. You know, some of it might be informative, some of it might be educational, you might throw in some humor there, uh, mixing mediums. So you can have polls or blogs and surveys, chat rooms, uh, breakout sessions, user groups. And so there's different ways to engage in the community. It's not all just, um, you know, looking at a screen online, but different ways to interact. The HubSpot example, I think, is a really good one for marketers, if any of you have engaged there. They provide a lot of resources. So things like templates that you can use in your day-to-day -day life, making it you know, impactful for your job, informative blogs, um, online courses, some are free, some are paid. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to interact with uh, different types of folks. So it's not only your peers, but it might be somebody within the company or a partner, employees. So, you know, this is just a good example that we've called out here in terms of a pretty thriving community. And now, Linda, I'm gonna stop sharing. And so if you want to bring up your stuff. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Great. So um, what, uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what the experience has been like building the IBM community. Um, I'm the program director for the digital engagement uh, components of uh, the IBM community, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, I have a, a colleague um, who also looks after all of the people interactions uh, on the community. And um, the the point that I really want to make here is that it's the the platform is what enables the conversation, but the conversations are uh, within the community are really what what brings community to life. Uh, when we set out to uh, create the IBM community, we were very intentional that this was going to be for people who use IBM products every day. IBM has done a really good job of reaching out um, to the C-suite executives and to line of business managers <clears throat> and to, uh, sorry, I'm having some allergies, so I'm gonna 
be clearing my throat a little bit <laughs> throughout the presentation, but, um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and they've done a really good job of, of um, creating those executive relationships. But where we really saw an opportunity uh, was with the users who are hands-on every, every single day with the products that, uh, that I, and technologies that IBM um, comes to market with. And those were really the people that we wanted to reach out to, to um, allow them to come together so that they could share with each other, they could learn, they could do more with the products. Um, and this, that was very intentional because we knew that the executive audience was um, very well covered and we knew the developer audience was very well covered. So this was really going after a particular segment. Uh, we built out our platform and I wanna talk a little bit about the platform, <clears throat> but then I wanna um, sort of zoom out and take a little, uh, uh, and take a deeper dive into all of the different activities that we're doing in the community. Uh, as Celia mentioned, we, you know, there are a lot of different platforms that you can use to enable these community uh, interactions. We happen to use a, a third party SaaS um, platform. And um, we did that because we wanted to make sure that not only was our uh, community enterprise scalable, obviously, you know, with the breadth of uh, IBM's portfolio and the sheer number of um, people that we knew that we would be able to reach. We knew that we wanted to make sure that, um, that we could scale. <clears throat> in addition to that, um, we uh, wanted to have a very customized experience because uh, IBM policies and processes are, are pretty, as you can imagine, um, pretty bureaucratic. And so we needed to be able to have that customization in order to be able to meet um, all of the um, compliance uh, requirements that we had. When you come into the community, so this is what I see when I log in. <clears throat> so this is uh, tailored, to, um, ta tailored to me particularly, um, you get not only some of the, uh, the uh, featured content, but you also start seeing about events. You can see we've got gamification enabled here. We've got badging. Um, and I, um, you know, this is customized to my view. I'm a member of these six groups, but there are other groups that I can, oh, I went ahead too soon. Um, but there are other groups that I can go and explore. This is a way to bring together birds of a feather uh, so that they can start having those uh, conversations about the technologies and the products that they care about. As you start down into the group experience, this is really where the activity takes place. So you can see we've got not only the um, highlighted content on the group homepage, but uh, in the discussion forums uh, and the libraries, uh, you start getting uh, those conversations that are happening. We've got blog posts and, um, uh, and events that are presented here. So people can very quickly start to um, find the area and the topics of interest um, in the IBM community that they're interested in. But more importantly, uh, in addition to um, the community.ibm.com site, uh, we're, we also have other ways to activate the community. Unfortunately, a couple of those are um, in real life events and uh, experiences, which we've had to pause or shift to digital. Um, but we are still engaging in these various different activities. So the way that we engage our audience um, is in, for example, um, we, uh, every year we, were we had been having <clears throat> a community day, which is where we bring our users together. We have a series of um, different, <clears throat> excuse me, discussion tracks and presentations, content presentations, allowing people to come together uh, in real life um, and uh, have those conversations about the, the deep technology conversations that they wanna, um, want to have and be hands-on with the products. Um, when we paused that, then we had to shift it to a virtual experience. And now what shifting to virtual community days has allowed us to do is not only replicate that very large event um, with uh, presentations across all kinds of different topics um, across IBM's portfolio. And we did do one of those in the spring, um, but it also has allowed us to really drill down and do virtual community days around a particular topic like um, data science or artificial intelligence or uh, IBM Z. And our audiences are really, uh, and our community members are really resonating with that. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you some uh, registration numbers in a minute, but what that does is it gives them the ability, the, the 
the events that we're holding allow these people to allow the community members to come together around the topics that they're interested in and they're learning from each other um, and they're we're giving them a platform to be able to share uh, what they know and to also um, support each other in their adoption of IBM um, technologies and products. Um, user groups were uh, global, um, were, were geographically based. So user groups is where a, and similar to a meetup where, <clears throat> and in fact, we have used the meetup platform to drive some of our user groups, where a, an IBM user in a particular geographic area will raise their hand and volunteer to bring together um, uh, people in that geography together to uh, talk about various different topics that they're interested in. Um, with the uh, pandemic, obviously that has had to shift to digital. Um, and much like we're doing today in this Zoom um, meeting, uh, the, those user groups are coming together and continuing to, um, to uh, gather and talk about the, the uh, topics that they're interested in. So these are the four ways that we activate the community. Um, the important part about this is uh, now how do we, because we do want to create that experience for our audience members where they're getting value from the community, but IBM is a, is a company that is, um, you know, we're a for-profit company. And so how do we then monetize this subscription model? There are a lot of ways that you can monetize subscription models the way that we do it is by uh, using those event registrations to drive pipeline. So the way that happens is we promote events in the community. When somebody goes to register for that event, whether it's a virtual community event or a webinar, um, virtual community day, then once that lead is, or that registration contact is captured, they can go flow into a marketing nurture uh, and from that marketing nurture, then we have a, um, um, a pipeline to revenue. Uh, and the uh, early results on this are, <clears throat> we're just starting to do some measurement on this now. Um, it's taken us a little while to get some instrumentation, but um, so far uh, we're seeing very, very good results from this kind of a monetization strategy. So for those of you who are working for for-profit companies, this is one way that you can monetize a subscription model. There are others. Um, this just happens to be the way that we do it. And these are a few of the numbers that we've got. Um, we like to count active members. Our database of, of users is actually, uh, of membership uh, is actually uh, over 200,000, but we count active members and, and active member is described um, or defined as anybody who has been on the community within the last 90 days and participating, uh, logging in and um, posting content. Um, we have over 191,000 meetup members. So those user groups that I was talking about, a lot of those are, are facilitated using the meetup platform. Uh, we've got 330 user groups around the world um, and you can see the other numbers. So virtual registrations, we've driven about 36,000 registrations years, year to date. And our webinar registrations uh, year to date are just over, um, I think that has ticked up a little bit uh, in September. So those are just up over about 35,000, I think, um, in web webinar registrations. So you can see we really drive a lot of activity, 167 community webinars. Um, and uh, with the shift to COVID, we've seen that that's really um, taken an uptick as well. So <clears throat> what I want to leave you with um, is you know, the technical platform isn't the end all be all. It really is about the community, um, the content and the people coming together. Um, one of the things that Celia mentioned earlier that I wanted to touch on real briefly is um, the notion of uh, having advocacy um, and advocates within your community. That's another component that we uh, drive at IBM. We've got a program called IBM Champions and our champions are, um, uh, non IBMers. So these are customers, um, clients that are uh, very familiar with IBM technology. They're active uh, in promoting um, and discussing and helping people with IBM technology. <clears throat> A lot of times they're speaking about uh, IBM uh, products and technology. They're writing about it. They're posting blogs and they're very, very active in the community and are very valued. So, um, you know, that's, that's the, the, the whole engine really for 
the community is having those champions, those advocates that are going to really participate and gin up um, activity and engagement within the community. So uh, I invite you to come and join. Uh, anybody can be um, a member of the IBM community. You don't have to be an IBM client or customer. You don't have to know anything about our products or technology. Uh, everybody's welcome um, to come and join. And if there's a topic of interest to you, I invite you to do that. Um, and so at that point, at this point, you can see I have um, COVID-19 hair. <laughs> 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 but we're, I think we're ready to, to uh, open it up for some questions. Well, thanks, Linda and Celia. It's a really great presentation. Folks, if you, you can use the chat, if you want to ask a question, you can also unmute yourself and ask. I will, I guess I will get, get us started. Uh, maybe this is for Linda. I'm curious about, IBM's got a distinct set of, I would imagine, business units, product offerings, et cetera. How are those organized or layered across the community? So um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and it really is, a, and it's really complicated. So what we try to do in the community is we try to structure our information architecture in a way that's logical for our users. It's not always easy to do that um, across a really broad product portfolio like IBM has. And there's a constant tension between do we reflect our business unit structure or do we reflect the way our audiences are and our community members are going to self-identify? And <clears throat> we have to push back on, you know, the marketing and offering management teams who want the, uh, the structure of the community, the information architecture of the community to really look like the BU structure that we have at IBM, but that's not how our, um, our users self-identify. So, we, we find ourselves in that constant tension and constantly pushing back. There are some, sometimes there are reasons to follow the, um, you know, the technology BU structure simply because um, it does make logical, when it does make logical sense for our, our users. So for example, you know, if you're, a, if you're interested in data and AI, um, you will find that there are some uh, ways that those topics can come together, right? So if you're a data and AI person, you're gonna be really interested in data management, you're gonna be interested in data operations, you're gonna be interested in data science, um, uh, and business analytics. And so those, we structure the community in a way that allow um, users to, to self-identify um, in that way. I, I have a question. Oh, uh, to the speakers as well as to anyone who's attending. But um, I know that I, IBM has done a number of things online or had done them already before, you know, pre-COVID. Yeah. Are there any best practices or advice that you could give to us, those of us who are giving, who are putting on events, say, that always used to, that, that required high touch personalization? I mean, how do you pull that off in the best way during, during a pandemic? It's, it's very challenging. Um, we had shifted to online, um, you know, to virtual community days. Um, we did that in 2019, I think. Um, <clears throat> and really what we did was we tried to create as much, um, as, as similar of an experience as we possibly could to an in-person event. So the, the virtual community days that we are, um, that we've had, had tracks. Uh, we used a a, a separate platform vendor, but um, it was, it enabled tracks of sessions. It had a chat function. It allowed you to um, not only chat within that window, but it also pointed you to the appropriate community discussion board. Um, so people could either chat in that, um, you know, in that platform or go to the community. So we were driving to community membership. Um, and the sessions, it, it, they, would, they ran all day. Um, so they ran from, uh, I think it was eight in the morning Eastern Standard Time to um, three or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the afternoon. Um, and you know, we just had three tracks with hour long sessions um, and tried to create as many ways for people to uh, you know, come together and converse as, as we could. Um, so you didn't need to shorten sessions um, mm -mm. or, you know, try and retain, I mean, people are sitting in front of computer Zoom all day. It seems that there would be fatigue. 
Yeah, well, I mean, they, I don't think they were sitting in front of their computers all day and watching every single session. They were popping in and out throughout. Yeah. But we still had very good attendance. I mean, there were a couple of our virtual community days where we had, you know, I, I don't think there was a single one where we had less than three or 4,000 people uh, wow. logged on. And, um, you know, there were a couple of them. In fact, our Z day just had, um, I think we had 12,000 attendees. So, you know, it was, um, and, and Z day was a, you know, that was a monster to, uh, to implement. It was, uh, but I mean, the team did a fantastic job. They did some great promotion and, um, they combined it with not just, um, information sessions, but they also had um, a codathon. thon um, So it was, you know, a, a, a coding session and people learned how to code as well. There's a question on the chat from um, Stanny. I got I was saying that correctly about how you <coughs> help filter, you know, toxic online discussions or inappropriate posts or, you know, kind of like bot chat. Yeah. Um, and um, in one of my experiences at Oracle, a couple ways that we did that. I mean, your moderator, your moderator is really key here in terms of staying on top of what content is out there. And so any sort of response, and in this case, it might be deleting the content can be removed quickly. Also, there's filtering um, in terms of the software can filter things that are clearly ads or inappropriate or bought. And also, uh, your membership. And for some reason you got put in the Canadian. Is that, sorry, I think somebody's having about some background noise there, but anyway, and also in terms of monitoring your membership. And so if you can see if there's a lot of bots joining or people that really aren't real folks that are going to participate, then filtering out those folks as well. So those are yeah. some ways that I know of. Um, and there's probably other ways, Linda, that you, that you've done at IBM that you can talk yeah. to. Yeah, um, one of the things that we do is uh, you can't post anything or uh, upload anything to the library until you're logged in. And uh, the first discussion post is always generated. <laughs> and the reason why we do that is because we wanna make sure that, it, that you're a human and not a bot. Um, and we wanna make sure that the content that you're posting is relevant. Um, we have a blogging program um, on our platform and Anybody can apply to be a blogger, but we do make sure that that person is um, uh, an actual human and we make sure that the content that they're posting is relevant to the topic uh, area that, and the group that they're, they're going to be posting in. So um, that filters out um, a significant amount of negative posts. The, the other thing I want to just mention is, um, you know, a lot of times our, particularly our marketing teams, um, and I'm a marketer and I get why, you know, marketing wants to do this. Um, our marketing teams are really reluctant to have negative comments about um, IBM technology or products posted. They, you know, they push, to, push back to remove any sort of negative um, product comments. And I'm not talking about, you know, being a jerk online. I'm talking about criticism of, you know, legitimate criticism of a product. Um, and our policy on that is that we don't want to remove that. The reason why we don't want to remove it is because we really want the community to be authentic. Um, and if somebody's having, having difficulty with a product or they have an opinion about the product, we want our offering management to be able to see that and inform the product direction. It's really valuable information. So, um, you know, negativity is not um, on, in a community is actually something that um, you shouldn't shy away from. And um, uh, the other thing that I will say about, about negative comments is um, it's a great opportunity to turn around an opinion. So, you know, if somebody posts a negative experience, um, it's a great way for offering management or a community manager to come in and uh, engage with that person and understand why they're having the problem and, and hopefully address it and, and maybe turn around their, that negative experience into a positive as well. There's also um, a question here. How do you make sure you engage with different personas who have different objectives, learning a topic, learning a product, signing up, et cetera, so you don't market too early and you don't miss an opportunity? Um, from my perspective, one of the key ways I think is, is 
making sure that your community is segmented correctly in terms of topics. And so who is joining it are going to be interested in a particular thread. So if you have a vastly different personas, consider having separate communities for that. Um, but also having different types of content. So you might have some you know, awareness, educational, and then you, you can have further down the food chain and something that if it's, for instance, in Linda's case, more specific about products, then they can be learning about, you know, more deep diving into products. Um, so it goes back to that having different uh, types of content, different mediums, and, you know, whether it's educational or funny, and so they have different ways to in, engage. And if, if you are setting up your community to be more of a demand gen generation funnel, it can't only be about that because people are going to sniff that out really quick and they're going to check out. So it can't be just a market that market market them. And I, Linda, I think you made that point too, that then, you know, people are, people are going to know it feels more like advertising than a real community. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I want to, I want to dive into that a little bit more. I, you know, obviously um, subscription model, uh, and monetizing a subscription model like a community is a tricky thing. Um, we really, and the reason why we monetize it the way we do is because uh, with using a uh, registration form for an event as the trigger point, as opposed to trying to market the community into the community is uh, exactly for that reason, Celia. It's, it's really about having an authentic experience. There's no reason why we can't have both the authentic experience and that authentic community um, um, you know, that authentic community sense of coming together um, and the, and then also make the offer to those community members of something that they might be interested in, um, whether it's a product trial, whether it's a, um, a, an event, reg you know, an event that they can go to, um, that's an additional value add, but we try to keep the community experience really um, very much about uh, users coming together and, and to have a conversation. The other thing I'm, I'm really um, very pleased about with our IBM community is that we're, I, I ran the numbers like a couple days ago and we are at the point where 75% of our membership is non IBMers. So this is not IBMers talking to each other. This is our clients talking to each other. And, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of discussion posts um, on these uh, on, on our discussion boards um, and, you know, IBMers are participating in the conversation, but we're not leading it. Um, one of the things that I, I tell uh, a lot of my IBM colleagues is this is not a marketing one directional um, message. Uh, there's value in that. And that's what our website is for. What we're doing, there's already a conversation that's going on about IBM products and IBM technologies that if we don't offer the platform to allow our users to come together and to engage in that conversation, then we don't have an opportunity to participate in it. And that's really what we want to do. We want to enable it so that we can participate in it and learn from it. And that's that's the experience that we want to bring to our IBM community members. So we have an interesting question here from Gabby. Gabby, I'll read it unless you want to jump in to uh, ask it yourself. I think this is relevant to both of you. Uh, okay, now let me get back to the question. So the IBM community is a user community and Gabby says there must be some overlap in best practices with employee communities, which I would imagine are behind the firewall. Is there anything that doesn't overlap? And is there anything you would implement in one group that you wouldn't in the other? So um, IBM does have uh, employee communities, but they're, they're not hosted on um, this platform. The, the community.ibm.com platform is exclusively an externally facing um, uh, experience. And uh, I don't have any influence or uh, um, purview in any of the internal communities. Um, they're, uh, they're hosted in a completely different environment. And obviously, Dennis, as you said, behind a firewall. Um, and uh, so there really is not an overlap. Um, Would you recommend that keeping them? I mean, IBM is a massive company, but like even with smaller startups or firms i mean do you recommend keeping those totally separate or i think it, or not? 
I think it really depends on what your goal is for the community. Um, in our case, it was really about empowering our users, um, you know, the people who are hands on every single day with the products and the technologies. And uh, it was not about, I mean, we absolutely encourage IBMers to participate and we want them on there because in um, you know, many instances, they are subject matter experts in, tech, in the technologies that they support or represent. Um, so we encourage IBMers to be on there, but we're really um, all about what is the user, what's that user experience and what user experience do we wanna create and how do we help them do, do their jobs better, learn more about the technologies, help them advance their careers, help them become experts on their own. Really, at the end of the day, if we can use the community to create more advocacy uh, around IBM products and, and technologies, then um, that's a success for us. I wanna chime in. Excellent. My, my, my advice has been that the more you combine them, the better and basically err on the side of having it just be one for all. I mean, you can sub-segment it based on topic and interest and stuff like a Slack channel, but the more you open it to the outside, the better. It's hard to do. And sometimes if it's a product roadmap or NDA stuff or you know company, then maybe you don't. But, but ideally even that stuff would be open. I think community is like the way of the future. Yeah. I, I... I don't know that that's necessarily the way that IBM would go, but I would agree with you, Shaheen, um, that you know, for most companies or for many companies, um, a culture of transparency is the is the is the way of the future. And I think some some companies are on that path faster than others. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I do rate IBM extremely highly. I think what you guys are doing is totally state of the art. And I'm not seeing it in other big companies. They, 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 they dabble, but none of them as comprehensive as you have done. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice to hear because all I hear about are the problems. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. You know, it's a big journey. But, yeah. I have some positive feedback. I'm curious yeah. if anyone on the, in the meetup wants to share a success story if they're, or if they're, they're in yeah. process of building a community or have a, have a story to share on there and what's going on. Yeah, who else is building communities? What's your experience? I, I actually have some experience in a past job where I worked at a software company that was building this online community software. And then coincidentally, that same company maintained an open source software stack for a content management system. So they had a built-in community of uh, .NET developers, it's Microsoft's .NET framework. So they had a million community members who, obviously you're, com you're contributing to the source code, which in itself is a community of developers and then a broader community of implementers. So it's really interesting to engage with these essentially developers who were coming together to, f to solve common problems like build a software and then the company provided some of the forums and other places that they can solve, help each other solve their problems. So it's pretty, I'm a big believer in community. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, use case uh, for community as well, um, where community is actually embedded in the product um, and is a feature of the product. Um, and that's, that, it's a great example of where community um, and support, you know, where it's monetizing the community, but it's also support re uh, cost reduction. Uh, where they come together and start blending. And it's the whole in product experience. And I think a lot of SaaS um, companies are starting to really think about community in that way as well. So actually, while we're on that topic, uh, so IBM related, I know Red Hat's now part of IBM. Is there still a Red Hat community separate or has there been some integration with the IBM community? Nope, it's separate. Um, and okay. uh, I, I don't know that that will... I think for the foreseeable future, that's probably going to continue to be separate. Um, there, we've had a few conversations about whether or not there should be some, uh, you know, some integration there, but I don't, there, no decisions. Yeah. I'm curious, especially after hearing about the IBM community and then hearing uh, about Dennis's experience, 
what do you think, uh, or how much difference do you think there is in terms of growing a community with one that carries the IBM name versus one that might not carry such a recognizable name in such a large community? Dennis, you want to take that oh, one? Well, you? my opinion is that, well, the name is always like the, the brand behind the community is very important, but I would say even more important than the brand behind it is the mission. And so the, the community I was part of, it happens to have a name called .NET Nuke. So it's not a very well known brand, but it was the mission because people were contributing source code to this community and also building solutions on top of it. So their kind of their livelihood was based on this open community of software developers. So they were very passionate. And so it's, it was all about the mission behind this collect, like the whole concept of what open source software is all about, just banding together to help uh, contribute to a, a shared project. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. I think a lot of uh, the word passionate is, is ultimately where what you would want to get to. If you think of like Trekkies, you know, I mean, talk about a long term community and <laughs> something that like isn't really even around anymore. And those people are really passionate. You know, if you could, you can have a community around something that might not initially have the brand name, but if it's a conversation that people are really passionate about, and they're they have an opportunity to, to, to share that passion with others, then um, it can still be really effective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, when Red Hat first started out, they, they were, their community was really the, um, the driving force behind their um, fast adoption. <clears throat> and they weren't a big company. So, uh, and, you know, so I don't, I don't think it's necessarily about um, the brand name behind it. I think it's really about what's the experience that the company is creating. And how, and as Celia said, how passionate the users are, uh, how passionate that audience is in coming together and, and discussing those topics. I think sometimes the brand could work against you if it feels too contrived as well. People might yeah. feel like it's less um, or it's more authentic, less filtered content, um, something that isn't, you know, like a Procter and Gamble or something that's do like a, you know, IBM is a big company and you guys have done so much good work there, but um, some of the a, large companies might have, an, might feel that members might feel like there's more of an opportunity to participate in yeah something that's less bureaucratic. I have, a, I have a great example of that actually, Celia. Um, I used to work at Oracle and I was at Oracle during the Eloqua uh, acquisition. Eloqua had an amazing community. And the, I can't remember what it was called, but, um, uh, oh, Topliners, it was called Topliners. And the Topliners community was incredibly active and had um, a huge membership. And when Oracle acquired uh, Eloqua and integrated them, uh, they started to change the community experience uh, and the community completely collapsed. So, you know, there's a situation where Eloqua um, had a fantastic community. And now that it's an Oracle, um, the users are fleeing. They, they didn't like that experience. They didn't like the change. They liked their top liners community the way it was. So. Nobody likes Darth Vader as the moderator. <laughs> Red Jack. Well, it was, <laughs> I could say a lot about Oracle, but let me just say this. Oracle had a very different business model and the, ex the community experience was not a top priority for them. And they, um, the business decisions that they made because of that changed the community experience. And that was why the membership um, didn't, why they uh, lost members in the community. So, you know, it was a, it was a business decision on Oracle's part um, to, you know, whether or not to invest in community and it, you know, they didn't see the value, so. So Celia, a question on Orion X, is there a role that you, you guys play with brands on community? Is there some offering you provide? We have helped um, companies set up their communities and establishing these best practices. In some cases, we function as kind of a virtual marketing department. So, you know, smaller companies, mid-sized companies where they don't always have the resources, we've effectively, you know, been kind of the outsourced component of that, either to set it up or to run them or help support their teams. Gotcha. I guess we're coming close to the close. So I guess to wrap up, I'll ask Linda and Celia for a closing 
let's say, closing sentence, if someone wanted to start to build their own online community, what is one thing they should be doing or thinking about? Linda, do you want to go first? Sure. I think it's really about understanding what you're trying to do with your community and what your goal is. Um, it's the, um, I wouldn't worry so much about, uh, the persona is important, but more importantly, it's really what's the experience that you want to create for that, for, um, for that user, for that persona. So, you know, there's always benefits to going first because then, you know, when they, they take your answer, it's like, dang, now I got to come up with something else. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so just along those lines, I would say, think it through first. It isn't something you just want to jump in and throw it up there and have it be inconsistent. You don't know who you're going after. So going through the steps that I, that I laid out are really critical and also having the commitment of um, engaging regularly ongoing and really being a part of it rather than, okay, I'm, I'm going to come and go and flitter and flatter, then it's just not going to be effective. People aren't going to know what to expect. Excellent. Well, Linda and Celia, thanks so much for joining us today. And to everyone else, thanks for joining as well. We Thank will be you. back Great in job. two weeks. My pleasure. Nice to thanks meet to you guys. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Very close. Thank you.